Russian army rising. The church is the breeding grounds for raising godly men and women who are willing to apply kingdom principles and values to bring transformation to their respective societies. We need to have a national focus. We don't have to lose this ambition or else we work against the Great Commission. They are equipped in righteousness. Unless our righteousness exceeds those who just know ABC and suffice others to do, but they don't do unless we see that we pray for god to raise right ministers in our nations we pray for god to raise right tax collectors we pray for god to raise right security agents they are bold and fearless standing your ground when the battle has been heated to such an extent that everyone is running away and we don't quit for we know no defeat the agenda to possess the nations. Welcome to an equipping center of the word and prayer on Pentecost hour. Stay tuned in. in we bless the name of the Lord for yet another opportunity to sit at his feet and to be fed of his word. Pentecost hymna number 19. Happiness is to know the Savior living a life within his favor, having a change in my behavior. Happiness is the law. Let's take it again. Happiness is to know the Savior living a life. Within his favor, having a change in my behavior, happiness is the Lord. Verse 2. Happiness is a new creation, Jesus and me, in close relation, having a is mine. Real joy is mine. No matter if teardrop starts, I found the secret. Tis Jesus in my heart. Happiness is to be for That's worth a living, taking a treasure that leads to heaven. Happiness is the Lord. Oh, happiness is the Lord. Happiness is the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Dearly beloved, if indeed there is something awesome that has happened to humanity, it's the death of Jesus Christ that has brought us salvation. So be happy that you are a Christian. Be confident and walk in thereof. We're discussing righteousness, the authority of the kingdom. As I said, the part one, we try to define and also try to appreciate the biblical perspective on righteousness. And as a way of recap, from Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 14, Bible enjoins us to put on the breastplate of righteousness. And then Hebrews 1 and 2 try to let us know that every kingdom has its totem, emblem, and symbols that defines them. And we say that in this kingdom that God is establishing, righteousness is the authority. The Bible says the scepter of his kingdom is a scepter of righteousness. Therefore, people who are subjects of the king, people who are citizens of the kingdom, 
can do nothing else than to live righteous life. That's why I say that the king loves righteousness and hates wickedness. Therefore, who those who live righteous life, he anoints them with oil of gladness. And then we define righteousness as behavior that is morally justifiable or right. Such behavior is characterized by accepted standards set by the Lord morally, injustice, virtue, or uprightness. That's the words we say where we go, our acts, and all that. And we said that because we are human, in order to be able to live righteous lives, therefore we ought to put on the breastplate of righteousness, which is, is our moral character. And I said in part one that the moral character or putting on the breastplate of righteousness is our defense to things that happen outside us, to be able to protect us from being evil and also help us to live righteous life. And we try to explain Psalm 1, verse 1 to 3, where we said to be righteous depends on where you walk, where you stand, and where you sit. Psalm 1 will tell us, blessed is blah, blah, blah. But three things, where you walk, where you stand, and where you sit. During the series under part two, we attempted to try to appreciate the righteousness of God as it relates to the believer's salvation. And under that, from Romans chapter 1, verse 18 to 32, and Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 6, we learned that humanity is depraved and the depravity caused our departure from righteousness, the presence of God. And therefore, Jesus, the primary reason for God to bring Jesus is to restore us to the righteousness of God. And in doing so, Jesus had to destroy the works of Satan, that is sin, the curses, and the fear of death. And then he tried to justify us and then put on his righteousness on us. And we dwell on 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Verse 21, where we said that for 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for our sake, you and I, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin so that you and I will become the righteousness of God. So we who have believed in Jesus Christ and have become sons of God, we are God's righteousness. And we said this righteousness comes in twofold. We are the imputed righteousness. We come to God with all our baggage of sins and God justifies us and dresses us anew. He imputes on us his righteousness. And I said that one is positional. God translates us from one kingdom into another. Our position changes. But spiritually after the position has changed he doesn't take us to heaven. He leaves us here to impact our righteousness. That is the functional. So have the vertical that is our positional our righteousness, imputed righteousness, who is the God-saving act. And then the functional aspect, leaving us in the system to be able to let people know the virtues, the righteous, the moral standards that we have so that they will learn of us and also be able to transform. In so doing, we have a very good society that is ready for the second coming of Christ. Therefore, Falling from our impacted righteousness, our functional work on earth, this morning our attempt to discuss with that righteousness and justice. So that is the part three of the series, righteousness and uh, justice. Proverbs chapter one and verse chapter eleven and verse one, because it's a teaching session, we may you may have to bear with me. We we'll, we'll come with a lot of quotations, God, I'm trying to decode, so I'll not pack as we packed it. I'm unpacking. So set your spiritual antenna right to be able to catch the message so that your TV screen doesn't become shh. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 1. A false, okay, that one, the Lord upholds this under skills, but accurate weights are his, his delight. 
Another version says, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. So God wants the system to be balanced. Isaiah 59, verse 15 to 17. Isaiah 59, 15 to 17 reads, Truth is lacking, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The Lord saw what is happening, and it displeased him that there was no justice. Justice. He saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then is his own arm brought him salvation, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and helmets of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in a zeal as a cloak. <clears throat> so from Isaiah 59, we observe that truth is nowhere to be found in the land. Therefore, God was worried that there was no justice and there was no man was trying to rescue the system. Therefore, God himself came into the scene and brought salvation. And then to be able to sustain the salvation that he has given us, he extended his righteous arm to hold the system. Therefore, God is walking in the system wearing breastplate of, uh, breastplate of righteousness and then helmet of salvation. This is even God. And in doing so, he's coming with vengeance because he has saved, he has given man all that he needs to be able to live righteous life. Therefore, it's important to appreciate the correlation between righteousness and uh, justice. Law without justice is a wound without a cure. Law without justice is a wound without a cure. That is when there is the law and it's binding everybody. But there is false balance. People are wounded forever and we can't cure it. William Scott Downey said that. And then Benjamin Disraeli said, justice is truth in action. We stand for truth and we work with truth. Then we, we become just. Justice is truth in action. So if you keep your truth, if you keep your light, and it doesn't challenge the system, there will, no be, there will be no justice in the system. So... Justice is truth in action. Then William Penn has also said that justice is justly presented blind because she sees no difference in parties' concern. She has but one skill and weight for rich and poor, great and small. So in saying that, if you want to be a just person, you close your eyes. You don't look at a person sitting before you. All you know is truth. All you know is the right you always want to balance the skills. You don't look at the person involved. You come with your standard, the norm. In our society, we all observe that these things are hard to come by. If you read Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, different versions, different versions, you come up that the scepter that the Bible is talking about, which is saying that is the seal, and the emblem of the church stands for uprightness, righteousness, and justice. So Hebrew 1, 8 and 9 sums it up to tell us that if you talk about righteous living, if you talk about just, if you talk about justice, it's the same as righteousness. You can't separate them. NIV will use scepter of justice, New King James Version will use scepter of righteousness, and then ESV will use scepter of uprightness. So the original Hebrew word that was used to explain or describe righteousness had four meanings. Rightness in subjective sense. When the thing is around you, you want to stand right. Justice in objective sense. When we are dealing with people, you want the standard to be observed. No discrimination. And then in your character, virtue in the moral sense. Virtue in the moral sense. It looks like I'm running a bit faster than you. 
So you come to the three circles, then move on there. Right, go to the next step. So the Hebrew word that we are using to explain this is rightness, justice, virtue, and prosperity. So in this word that we're talking about, chidika, which is a Hebrew word, it stands for rightness. Sometimes God wants to describe how he wants the people to, to live. We use the same word. So when we talk about righteousness, it's the same as justice, and it's the same as being upright. Rightness, justice, virtue, and sometimes in figurative terms, you say that righteousness is all the nation. It's talking about prosperity that righteousness brings. So Romans chapter 14, verse 17, and Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, brings a discussion, something that challenges us. Romans 14, 17 says that, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. This is after Paul has come to encounter Christ and is trying to appreciate and explain how and what the kingdom of God is. Before that, Jesus had taught his disciples to pray this way, Matthew 6, 10. Now when you pray, say, Our Father, we are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So putting these two quotations together, we observe that if we pray that the kingdom of God should come on earth as it is in heaven, it then suggests that we want to experience God's righteousness, which is justice on the land. We want to experience God's peace. You read Bible, you get to a point, it says that righteousness and peace have kissed. They are kissing, they have embraced themselves. It means that if we are praying that God's kingdom should come, after the prayer, the result is that we want to see righteousness on the land, we want to experience peace, and want to have joy that the Holy Spirit brings. The Bible tells us that God is just. This means that he's fair and impartial. It also means that he hates the ill treatment and oppression of people, of nature and nature, which he has created. He hates lying, cheating, and other forms of mistreatment. It is worth noting that God is justice. Therefore, he deals with sin. In the same vein, he's a merciful God. Therefore, in the passion of Christ, Jesus being on the cross, we see justice at play, where God wants to punish sin. Because the wages of sin is death. So Jesus carries our iniquities on the cross to, to atone for our sins. And then mercy interspersed. What we were due, what was due us. God said, I won't give you that. You, need, you, you were supposed to be punished. But I've put that punishment on Christ. And therefore you come with mercy. Therefore you receive mercy from the cross. So God, as we are saying, is a just God. And if you say God is a just God, let's notice one. God shows no partiality. Acts chapter 10 and verse 34. God shows no partiality when we come before him. Therefore, we should act in the same vein too. He commands against the mistreatment of others. Zechariah 7.10. Dealing with people, God commands, he instructs that we should be fair. We should not mistreat others. He perfectly executes vengeance against oppressors. If you read the Bible well, with the quotations there, Second Thessalonians 1, 6, Romans 12, 19, we observe that. And then Hebrews 6, 10 tells us that God is just in meting out rewards. It says that God is not unjust. He will not forget. So when we do good, God rewards. When we do evil, he also rewards. But that one is payment or in a form of punishment. He's equally just in meting out punishment. So Hebrews 6, 10 tells us that he meets out rewards to those who live right and also punishes those who live, uh, e who are evil. That's Colossians 3, 25. And from Psalm 89, verse 14, we see that justice and righteousness 
which always work hand in hand are the foundation of God's throne. So we're observing that when we're talking about God, we're talking about God who is righteous, and because he's righteous, he is a just God and he punishes evil. If you read that account, read accounts in Genesis chapter 3, when man sinned, God couldn't just turn his eyes and overlook what men did. Sometimes you think that it's, it's something God could have excused them. But I look at it from an angle where we are serving the Lord God Almighty, whom nobody challenges. The angels are surrounding him and calling him holy, holy, and always praising him. And he creates a mortal being from the dust. And the, the, the dust flouts his laws, and you think he should go scot free. No, because he's a just God. He came with anger, as it were, to, to punish what they have done. So when God is dealing with us, he expects us to be people who are right and also are prepared to live righteous life. So God is just, and his justice is an indispensable part of his character. In the same way that he loves and shows mercy, he also punishes. Let's underscore that fact. Without his justice, sin will run unchecked in the system. Evil will win. Everybody will do whatever he or she likes. There will be no reward for obedience. I will not respect a God who was once just or continues to be just. So sometimes I, I say that if God doesn't punish evil today, then God should go back and apologize to Adam. And will God apologize? He's sovereign. If he doesn't punish people who practice LGBTQ, then he should go back to Sodom and Gomorrah and apologize. I'm sorry, I erred. If he doesn't punish thieves, you, go and apologize, you should go back and apologize to Achan for punishing him. But because he's sovereign, and from Genesis, he started punishing evil. If today we sin and we don't punish, he doesn't punish us, he should go back and apologize. But because he's a sovereign God and he owes no mortal being an apology, he has to punish. That is his justice. Because he, 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 he abhors unbalanced skills and appreciates a just cause. Therefore, Micah chapter 6 and verse 8, Micah chapter 6 verse 8, summarizes all that we are saying that there are top three qualities God wants to see reflected in us. Micah 6, 8 says, He has told you, O man, what is good? And what does the law require of you but to do just? and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. So all that God requires of us, because his righteousness and his righteousness is equated to justice, and he has paid the debt we owe by virtue of us being sinful, he has translated us into his kingdom, which we are saying the seal on that kingdom is righteousness. And therefore, he commands that those who are subject in this kingdom, he commands us to do justice, to love kindness, and to work humbly with our God. So this leads us to repentance. Having come this far, bearing fruit in keeping with repentance is key. Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. That's why the moral decadence in society God has provided redemption through the finished work of Christ on the cross and through the resurrection. The role of humanity is to decide by their free will. He does not compel us to go against his will. God does not compel us, but he always encourages us to move with our own will. And then we respond to the gospel by accepting him and after setting, we receive forgiveness of sin. And then the Holy Spirit comes in us to help us to live right. Therefore, when John the Baptist was preaching repentance, he based his message on repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And we are saying that the kingdom of God, the seal is righteousness. Therefore, you can't approach 
the righteous kingdom with evil. So repent. Be a just person. Be at the same plane as God because the kingdom is at hand. And then he called the people to turn around from their evil ways and as it were, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. So you said you have repented. You said you have accepted Christ as your personal savior. Therefore, he has translated you from one kingdom onto that. And he suggests to God, he can't countenance or entertain evil in his kingdom. He deals, he punishes from Adam. He keeps punishing. So he can't sneak into it. That's why in one of the parables, Jesus said that the, the king threw a party, invited people to come. People were not coming. They went to the street begging people to come. But when they came in, he found somebody and said, wow, how come you are in here without wearing a wedding garment? So you come the way, irrespective of your background, but when you come, he expects you to have, to bear the fruit in keeping with repentance. So if you read Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 to 12, the explanation is well given in Luke chapter 3. If you look, let's jump and read Luke chapter 3, verse 10 to 14. And the crowds asked him, what then shall we do? And he answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to, the, to be baptized and he said to them, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers, soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation and be content with your wages. So, if you go back to that chapter 3 and verse 8, bearing fruit worthy of repentance is when they ask, what then shall we do? The people who came wanted to know what they should do. Dearly beloved in the Lord, and when I met the ministers, I was asking them whether they forgotten why they came into a ministry. Once in a while, you have to do, apply the brakes and do some stock taking. Am I on course? Why am I here? So the people came. They wanted to follow Christ. Or they wanted to accept the message of repentance that uh, John was preaching. So they asked, what should we do? Because they said they should keep bearing fruit. That is in tandem with righteousness. So first, he tells those who have an abundance of possession to share with those who have nothing. That's the verse 10. He then gives instruction to task collectors and soldiers relate, relating directly to their work. So generally the crowd came, what should we do? Then he said, simple, you can't live in this kingdom in essence. You can't be a greedy person. There must be equity in the kingdom. You can't continue to cheat. So once you've come, if you have something in essence, share it. Then the task collectors and the soldiers also came. And then he also asked them, not to extort, as it were. So he told the tax collectors to collect only what they are required to, rather than pardon the tax bill and pocketing the difference. Soldiers should not use the power to extort money and accuse people falsely. They should be content with their pay. If you read various commentaries and various versions, you observe that in those days, the tax collectors, there was something they called tax farm. So it's like, I would say, give me a quitter man. How much do you want me to pay to the mayor? The mayor say, I'll require one million from you, only from a quitter man. So I'll go and plan with my people and I'll pad it and I'll surcharge it on them and say 10 million. So I'll exert it from people and go and, uh, and, go and then give the mayor one. That's why John tells them in Luke chapter 3, verse 13, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Yours is a, a profit margin. But you shouldn't exact, you shouldn't, as it were, I mean, squeeze money from the people because you want to be rich. That was the order of the day. 
And I hope and believe that it shouldn't be the other in our time because we are Christians. So the work that has been given to you, you should be able to do as you are expected to do. So notice that John does not offer them the option to stop being tax collectors or soldiers. So he's not saying that they should stop their work, but they should work within the remits and the parameters set in their work and then follow the work ethics. You sign a contract to go to work at 8 and close at 4.30. You get to the place at 10 and you say it is traffic. At 2 o'clock, you go to pick your, your child at school and come back at four. You go to the ministry, this is what is happening. You have an appointment, you sit and sit and sit and nobody comes and nobody cares. Sometimes you have an appointment even with the big man himself, the person in charge at the office. Gives you 8.30, you go and sit at 11. And they, can, they are bold enough to give flimsy excuses. Christians dare not to do that because we are supposed to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. If you follow that, Part two, we observe that these things belong to our past. That is Romans chapter one. We were that. It comes to Ephesians chapter two. We said we were dead in sin. We were. So now we can't be dying in sin. We did not know God, but now we know God. So John was trying to instruct the people to work within the parameters of their work. Let me pause and let's reflect. Good occupational groups, as we have organized in the church these days, the guilds, ask these questions. School teachers, can you ask what should we do to make our work effective? What should we do? Go back to the contract that you signed at the point of engagement. Because you wanted the job, you accepted everything and signed. Now you are in the work. Now you are at the workplace. You take all the pens home. You take all the chalk home, and then you are using it to do private work. And each and every time, there's shortage of supplies from government. There's shortage. But go to people's homes, these things are there. We are talking about righteousness and justice. We serve a just God who have all on balance skills. Business executives, can we ask what should we do? Are we paying our member, our, our workers' rights, their wages right? Are we cheating them? The contracts that we are signing, are we pardoning the contract sums and sharing? We are in a country where we, we construct a road, a road that is supposed to last for about 15 years, six months, it's eroded. Sometimes it's on record that the road is completed. As an engineer, I know some roads are supposed to have three cost layers, two, and then they do the one and it's recorded as complete. So where is the second layer money and the third layer money? Business executives, if we are Christians, we are enjoying to bear fruit in keeping with repentance because righteousness equates justice. And justice comes with vengeance, even though there is an element of mercy. Market women, store assistants, can you also ask what should we do this morning as a Christian? If you're a tailor, you're a seamstress. I remember when we were kids, there was this guy who give you all the sweet words that you have your wedding or your, your, your dress. And once it happened to a friend of mine, the wedding had ended and the guy was still at the terrain shop. What a disappointment. People do this with impunity. They give you an appointment, it doesn't come on. You do your part of the contract and they fail. But meanwhile, they will be bold enough to go to church and dance, dancing around their throne no of glory. And when we are singing, well, kron, kron, yeah, yeah, me fair, they all sing. So if God's holiness is beauty in your eyes, why are you not also following him? Office workers, I've spoken about our time. You go to office, even those who are there are playing games on computer. Office hours. No other person came late. So what do we really do that we should be paid the money that we, are, we have signed to, to take? Remember, as a Christian, the taxi drivers and the truck drivers, health professionals. I want each and every person this morning, either seated here listening to me or watching us online, as a Christian, reflect on your contract. Reflect on the work that you are doing. In our time and age, it looks like people say the government is pretending to be paying and therefore workers are also pretending to be working. But both, if they are Christians, at both ends, God abhors pretension. There shouldn't be a pretense of pain and a pretense of 
working, then where are we? This belongs to Romans chapter 1, when we were evil, where we were slanders, where we were cheaters. But in this kingdom, the seal, the mark, the totem, the emblem, what leads us is righteousness. Luke chapter 19, verse 1 to 10. It's a case study of a, th- a true repentance. Luke chapter 19, verse 1 to 10. Luke 19, 1 to 10. We didn't have time, 1 to 10. We wouldn't have time to read everything. But here, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, after the encounter with Jesus. Now Zacchaeus, everybody knew he was a bad man. He's a tax collector. Remember, John says the tax collector should take just what the contract says. And the soldiers should not have thought. So we see Zacchaeus was a tax collector. So there's a, 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 a tax farm. So Zacchaeus is in charge of Akwetema. And they're supposed to pay one million. And he goes to pad it to 10 million. Now he meets Jesus. Jesus comes to his house. And people are marveling. This man says he's a righteous person. And he goes into that sinful person's heart. Beloved, let me pause and ask have people ever asked you, are you also a Christian? One so we are Christian. This is a question I fear. One so we are apostle. This is a question I fear. Are you also among the elders? People thought Sakio didn't bend, uh, as it were, didn't deserve Jesus going to his house. So they were asking questions. And then when he had an encounter, the Bible says, he told the Lord, I will give half of my wealth to the poor. John said, those who have in abundance, they should share. And if I have cheated people on their tax, he knew. I'll give them back four times. You see? So Zacchaeus knew he was pardoning it four times. So after meeting Jesus, I'll go back to Aquitema, restitution. Last year, I was supposed to pay 10 cities. I, I made you pay 40. That is repentance. You can't keep what you stole and still say you are clean. So Zacchaeus took the bold step. He goes into reserve and he says, I want to share equity. And then he realized that this poor woman sitting by the roadside, I really cheated her. So Jesus, I want to go back. I was supposed to take one but I took four times. Are Christians listening to me this morning? If we are really calling ourselves Christians, we are enjoying to bear fruit in keeping with repentance because the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot re- comprehend it. No. Yes, they are corrupt, but we can't. I'll give back four times as much. Then Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home. Wow. So it's not a person allowing himself to be baptized. It's not a person speaking big tongues. It's not a person paying big tithes. It's not a person rising to the highest level in the church or institution. But a complete turnaround. Salvation has come to this home. Today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. So it depends on you after the justification has been bestowed on you, after you've been sanctified. It depends on your works. So Jesus said, Wow, indeed, salvation has come to this house. But this man that they call a cheat, this, this task collector who did, people even didn't want me to enter his house has had a complete turnaround and given things back to the people he took from. Then indeed, salvation has come to this house. And this man is a true. Jesus himself saying somebody is a true son of Abraham. Where do you have another? So Zacchaeus is a living example of repentance in our time. Repentance is a change of hearts that leads to a change of life. A change of of hearts that leads to a change of life. What some people say is that the Christianity is in house, in their hearts, in religion. Christ, so someone there, I tell them, it is only God 
who looks at their heart. Man looks at outward. So let God deal with their inside. I want to deal with the outside. You can't say I'm sanctimonious and I feel you are walking, you don't even want to hurt a fry, and then you are damn wicked outside. No. What we see is what we used to charge you. Jesus saw. So repentance is a change. It had at least to a change of life. So Zacchaeus was touched and therefore changed. Dearly beloved in the Lord, righteousness this morning we are saying is equal to justice. It's equal to equity. Bribery and corruption. Our God values honest and truthfulness because they ensure a just society. The God that we serve, he values honesty and truthfulness. God's people are instructed not to steal, lie, or deceive one another. If you read Leviticus chapter 19, you realize God kept retreating that I am the Lord. When he wants, then he, Allah, he says, I am the Lord. It suggests that God is particular about what he's saying and the punishment thereof. So if you're talking about don't lie, I am the Lord. Don't cheat, I am the Lord. Don't deceive, I am the Lord. It means his anger and vengeance will come because we all know vengeance is the Lord. In the Old Testament, bribery is regularly used as a Hebrew word for corruption. So I see bribery is equivalent to corruption. It is therefore important to look at what bribery really is and what it does to a society. Let me spend some five minutes to wind up. Bribery is a common practice in business as well as in government. Is the payment, as well as in government, is the payment, sorry, a common practice in business as far as, as well as in government is the payment of bribe. That is, is, is common in the system. If you, people deliberately de, 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 uh, prolong the system, frustrate the system, they will post their thing is 48 hours. You, you apply and it's taking you two months. So if you want to get it, it's, it's deliberate. You pay something. A bribe is fine as anything, especially money, which is given or promised to cause a person to do something illegal or wrong. So I'm a pastor going to church, I'm late. I cross the red light, and the policeman is there. No, I'm going to officiate a wedding. What do I do? I give the person money, so that allows me to go and do what I think is right. So the blessings and things I'm going, already God has negated me, because I paid my way through. These are small, small things we take for granted, but God is a just God. He's a just God. He doesn't change the skills. So a bribe is money, favor, or other consideration given in exchange for one's influence against what is true, right, or just. Let me take this again. A bribe is money, favor, or other consideration given in exchange for one's influence against what is true, right, and just. I know this thing doesn't belong to me, but I want to take it. Pastor Sian is in charge of signing the document. So if I give him money, I offer something, I give him land, I offer to pay the child school fees in advance, offer the wife a trip to Dubai, with the intention of obstructing truth, right and just, I'm paying bribe. In the Old Testament, they were encouraged to give gifts, but anything that suggests you want to twist somebody's arm, is bribery. Any benefit given or accepted to influence decisions is a bribe. And bribery is an offense against God, the weak, the innocent, and the community. Righteousness equal to justice. Sometimes business officials will not grant a person the help he is entitled to have unless the person pays a sum of amount, money, he knows that this, I just have to sign. Those days, they used to say, if you don't put weight on your file, it flies at the office. And we, Christians say it. What do men now? And from Abba Baku, you, there's a story where a friend wanted something. They are taking ages. You go, the file is not there. You go, the file is not there. Somebody advised him to do this and do that. The person went to do that, and suddenly the file was found the same day. 
Is it a system we want to build as Christians? No. People sit on people's appointments until they give them a favor. A lady attends an interview. She has passed. And the person is supposed to go for the appointment letter. But the boss says, meet me at a hotel. Oh, do we sign contract at hotel? I attended an interview at your conference with board members. So why not leave the appointment letter with the secretary? He wants a favor. The Bible is clear that giving or receiving a bribe is evil, even though primarily we are supposed to give, we are supposed to support the weak, we are supposed to, as it were, extend or share what God has given us with people. But anything that is done with the intention of twisting somebody's arm is bribery. God's law given to Moses for the people forbid the taking of bribes. Exodus 23 verse 8. For a bribe blinds the discerning and perverts the works of the righteous. If you take bribe, your eyes become blurred. You see blue. And because of bribe, you are saying it's light green. Oh, everybody is saying blue, but the man is saying light green. He's taking some gold somewhere. After chewing the gold, you can't do it otherwise. Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse 19. It says that you shall not pervert justice. You shall not show, you shall not show partiality. Not take a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. Person I know from from. Twist the words. What did I say? I said blue. I said, no, that, that thing is green. Is that so? Then it's light green. Ah, this thing is pure green, and the man is trying to graduate the color. The eye is bled. He's eating what he's not supposed to eat. Job chapter 15 and verse 34 says that for the company of the godless is barren, and fire consumes the tent of bribery. This is in Bible. Those who take bribe, fire consumes their tent. And then Proverbs 17, 23. The wicked accepts a bribe in secret to pervert ways of justice. Dearly beloved, the negative effects of taking a bribe are clearly outlined in all these passages and many others. Let's say that bribery perverts justice. And if his justice is equated to righteousness, it means if we take bribe, we have become wicked and evil. We don't belong to the kingdom. True justice cannot coexist with bribery. That is true righteousness, true justice, being upright, being a person of integrity. That character cannot coexist with bribery because bribery blindfolds and it doesn't let you get what you want. There is a system, this thing in the system where we say, you scratch my back, I scratch your back. It's not in the Bible. We don't scratch anybody's back. We do the right thing, he does the right thing. Because God will charge all of us. Extortion, another sinful practice which is related to bribery is extortion. Extortion is taking money from someone by violence. That is what the soldiers were advised. Don't extort, be content. Taking money from someone by violence, threat, or misuse of authority. It's only people in authority who are able to extort. If you don't do this, I'll not do that. Yes. So they will sit on people's promotion. They will sit and sit and sit. And you see that all the genius are rising because they are giving favors either in cash or in kind. But the person who doesn't want to pay will not get there. So extortion is exacting taking money, favor from somebody by violence, threats. I would not find my man now. It's a threat. And if your boss is saying, if you don't give it to me, you will not take it, then you are in trouble. So the one who demands a bribe is prepared to take by force. It's an extortioner. He wants the money and you are not giving and he's forcing you to give. Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 14 to 17 as we wind up. Nehemiah chapter 5. We see Nehemiah using his privileges associated with position to serve people. We don't have time to go into this, but I have time to read and assimilate what is there. Moreover, from the 28th year of King Atazazus, when I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, 
until his 32nd year, 12 years sitting in the chair, being in authority. Neither I nor my brothers ate the food allotted to the governor. But the earlier governors, those preceding me, assuming they didn't know God, placed a heavy burden on the people and took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to food and wine. Their assistants also lauded it over the people. But out of reverence of God, I did not act like that. Please say this after me. But out of reverence of God, I did not act like that. Say amen to that. Okay, let me continue. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this world, the assignment. All my men were assembled there for the work. And this is what challenges me. We did not acquire a land. How come, my dear sister, who, mommy, without apology, a whole mayor said there are lands and I didn't take it. Watch on the walls. Any government comes, strategic lands are sold. But Nehemiah says, for him, he, neither him or his assistant, they did not acquire any land. For a mayor, a minister, somebody with authority to say that during my time, I do not take any strategic land. The person is a righteous person. Or any juicy thing in the land didn't come to me and my family. The person is a righteous person. Furthermore, 150 Jews and officials at, at my table, as well as those who came to us from the surrounding nations, this man was not taking the privileges, he was not taking the allowances, he was not taking even what he was due, the allowance. he was just living on a salary, fine. You go to your system, some people's allowances are about 10 times their own wages, but he wouldn't do that. He wants to live with his Salah. And then anything that was juicy that he could use his power to take, he didn't take. Then he moved on to bring the weak and the vulnerable to come and eat, dine on his table. And he did this for 12 years. Let me conclude. Owen White writes, we live in a world largely motivated by selfishness, dominated by greed, and controlled by money. In such an atmosphere, sacred things are ruthlessly sacrificed and even spiritual things commercialized and cheapened. This should not be said about us. Yes, people are selfish. Yes, people are greedy. Yes, money controls the system. But we can never sacrifice spiritual things nor commercialize or cheapen our salvation because... He has told you, oh man, what is good? And what does the law require of you? But to do justice and love kindness and to walk humbly with your God because the God we serve is a righteous God and a just God. He rewards righteousness and punish wickedness. May he alone have mercy on us. Amen. Subscribe to our social media handles for life-transforming messages.